Welcome to Scoreography, a podcast about the greatest sport on ice, figure skating. I'm Wendy Buskey. And I'm Adrian Buskey. And this episode is going to be kind of a short episode focused on the show skate season, the in-between time period where it's skaters who've gotten done with primary competition. Maybe they're already working on next year's programs, but they've got some time to go and do some regional skating events, some exhibition programs. And we've seen some of that stuff and we kind of want to cover a bunch of it. Yeah. And talk about the uh, unfortunate fact that the U.S. doesn't get much of it this season. So going to whine about that a little bit here and there. Yeah. But first off, I want to apologize. We didn't have an episode last week because I put a post out about it on YouTube, but I didn't really spread it wide on social media or anything. But I got COVID and uh, and, yeah, I had to walk away and isolate for 10 days. I was sick for quite a while. We have a disabled family member in our household. And so we have to be really careful, even more so than just kind of a general like you get an illness, you try to protect your family from it. But for us, for a lot of reasons, we have to be kind of extra careful. So part of the problem I had during that was it had a big impact on my throat and on my voice, which illness often does. I was under doctor's orders to rest my throat and kind of not talk as much as possible. So if you've listened to the show, you know, that's not the easiest thing for me. I was going to say that is a really, really difficult ask for a doctor (laughs) to give to Adrian. So understand the challenge for all of us. I'm used to having a very chatty husband. Yeah. So I spent a week of being a really quiet person here in the household, which I think kind of made Wendy nuts a few times because she's used to me filling a lot of space. So we had to skip last week's episode. And in going to this one, I think we're going to keep keep this relatively short just because I am still struggling a little bit. My vocal cords are a bit strained. So I'm going to try to continue to give you as good a dulcet tone as I can. But (laughs) uh, for the time being, I just kind of have to go easy on it. So yeah, let's dive into this. Let's talk a little bit about About show season. Show season. Here in the States, most of the time when you think of show skates, you think of stars on ice. Yes. And that has been going on in Japan for a little while. The, The tour is done now. The tour of Japan is done. And if you were like us, kind of in the post world's downslide into the off season on Wii, if you will, (laughs) (laughs) it was kind of joy inducing watching all of the social posts from especially Piper. Piper Gill has posted a lot of really fun videos from backstage and Lots of Keegan Messing uh, doing backflips over however many humans he could. I think five was the the, the the big total. Yeah, like um, jumping over Satoko Miyahara, who... uh, Satoko. (laughs) (laughs) International bestie Satoko Miyahara. (laughs) And Maddie and Luna Hendricks. So it was fun to see all of those posts, but also just cool to see people like Kaori Sakamoto being a part of it in Japan and debuting a new exhibition program. Japan always knows how to put on great ice shows. Oh my gosh. They are, I think, kind of the undisputed champions of touring ice programs over there. So what you got with their stars on ice was both almost all of the major current competing Japanese names over there because you did have Kaori Sakamoto, Mona Chiba, Shoma Uno, I don't think I saw Yuma Kagiyama on any of the stops. You know, I didn't see Yuma on any of those. No, um, he was you, the one missing. But you also had Mao Shimada, who, of course, is the up and coming uh, junior skater who's incredible. I think Reno Zono was in there as well. Hana Yoshida. Hana Yosh- oh. which, And we'll talk a little bit about some of the cute things we saw there. But Hana Yoshida and Isabel Levito seem to have become really great friends during this. And so there was a lot of cute posts of the two of them wandering around Japan together. It was really adorable. Yeah, you had this amazing lineup of the Japanese skaters, and I'm missing a bunch, so I, you know, I apologize. I don't have a whole list in front of me. But then you have a lot of the other international skaters that are really great on it as well, too. Yeah, for the first time, I believe Deanna Stellato Dudek and Maxime Deschamps were invited in part of the show, which had to be wonderful for them as newly crowned world champions to go straight to Japan and tour the country as world champions. I just can't imagine how exciting that had to be for well, them. Well, you had all of the world champions in yeah. this event because you had Cowrie, you had Max and Deanna, you had Shock and Bates, and you had Ilya all on this tour. Yeah. What an incredible lineup. Right. And then, like you mentioned, you've got Luna Hendricks, you have Isabel Levito, Piper and Paul, Keegan Messing, just a dynamite list. I mean, I, I, again, I know I'm missing people. We mentioned Satoko Miyahara, who I've talked about on the show before. We saw on Stars and Ice here in the States last year. 
and I had never seen her live. And honestly, I wasn't super familiar with her skating from before. And now I'm like in the Satoko fan club because seeing her <laughs> live, she is phenomenal. Well, seeing so many of these people live, it's what we've talked about a lot. It is why it is such a deep seated bummer that we're not getting a U.S. Stars on Ice tour this year. Because seeing this group of skaters, it's boggling as a fan to like have that group touring the country. I sell a good portion of the things in my office right now. <laughs> so I get to go see that tour. Skip coffees for like the next three months. It would be worth it. Wow, that's a big ask. You, yeah, it might actually coffee, be too much. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. As somebody who has to live with you, I don't yeah, I don't know that fair. we'd make that kind of sacrifice. But that's a good point. <laughs> We've talked with people in the comments, and I think we covered a little bit in our Q&A episode too, but seeing skating live is a very transformative thing. I think that a lot of people who would maybe be kind of middle tier or on the fence about whether or not skating was a sport they really wanted to get into, think seeing great skaters live can really change the conversation because it gives you an opportunity to see just how really incredible this stuff is. Because seeing it up close, you know, when we were at Stars and Ice, we were near the floor. It's one thing to be high up and watching something happen, but it's another to actually see Alexa Kinnearum being held in the air over your head. <laughs> yes. uh, like that changes the perspective and the feeling about all of it in a big way. And I just think that this is one of those sports and an artistic sport that just begs for live performance. And so it makes me sad that we don't get as much of it in the States right now, especially about out of Stars on Ice. But like we were talking about in the posts for this, unfortunately, I think sometimes when you look at like Instagram, a lot of things get put into stories and then they kind of disappear. But there's still a lot of posts. If you haven't seen them, they should go check out, like you said, Piper's feed on Instagram was particularly great for sharing lots of behind the scenes stuff. And a lot of the camaraderie happening over there in Japan, this international crew of skaters going and doing so much stuff together. You had little sub squads of them going on adventures. And it was often not the group of people that you would have expected, which I think is great. I loved that you'd see like Luna Hendricks with Maxime Deschamps, Satoko Miyahara and Isabeau Levito and Hana Yoshida. At like Disney World. Right. It was something like that. No, I think it was Ilya and Luna and Max at Disney World. I don't know. Oh, I forgot that Junmon Cha was on this I know. I kept thinking, well. like, who oh am I forgetting? Gosh. How could I forget Jun? Well, Junmon Cha. And, and again, <laughs> you've got lots of really adorable photos of Junma and Ilya who get along amazingly. And they're clowning around together. And uh, there's a, a hilarious photo of Isabeau getting a piggyback ride from Junma on the there's ice. There's one of so Ilya funny. getting a piggyback yeah. ride from Junma. <laughs> Which was delightful. And there's incredible photos of Ilya and Kauri goofing around together. And there's this one amazing shot of Ilya wearing Kauri's hat while she's skating with her laces completely undone. Which is I, terrifying. It looks like it should be a 90s hip hop album cover almost <laughs> because they look so ridiculous, but in all these super fun ways. And, you know, what you always see and what you always hear is that Kauri does not speak English or does not speak it well. And it frustrates everybody internationally because she's clearly so funny and so engaging and so charismatic. Everybody wants to know what she's saying and what she's doing. But very clearly, people who do not have a common language between each other, were still having fun together and clowning around and having a good time. This is the thing, and I've said it before, and I will say it like a broken record about this sport. If you want to grow skating with a younger audience... Competition is obviously extremely important. The athletics are extremely important. The rivalries and record breaking, all that stuff is a big deal. But showing what this does on an international level, showing how the international competitors connect with each other, become friends, support each other, even in competition, I think that is the most valuable aspect of this sport that should be pushed a lot more. And I don't think that American sports coverage ever shows that off enough. Um, mm -hmm. because they are just so American centric. I think that if you want a young audience to really appreciate this, one of the best things you could do is show what their lives are like off the ice and how it fosters international connection. I think we've talked about it before. It, it weirdly makes me think of things like American Ninja Warrior, not in the sense that those two things, you know, skating and Ninja Warrior, are anything alike, but they're always cheering for each other on that show. And while it, the Ninja Warrior sport phenomenon may not be as popular as it was maybe a few years ago, we saw gyms pop up everywhere because of the fact that you would want to compete to be the best and to be the fastest and get through the most obstacles. But then also 
turn around and cheer on your fellow teammates who you wanted to see succeed too and do really cool things. A big part of the appeal is the community. Yeah, exactly. And I really think skating has so much of that. You look at these types of tours and see competitors that a week ago were rivals and now are going shopping together and having dinner together. And it's just lovely. I don't know. There's something really wonderful about it. And especially in this age of looking for connection, showing that side of it, I think would be well worth the time. I think also for young skaters wanting to get into the sport or even adults that are looking into get into like novice or pre-novice or whatever non-elite level, but to enjoy the sport on that level as well. This sport, it has a lot in common with gymnastics in the sense that it can be very isolating because the amount of hours that go into it, the specific places that you have to go. And it's not a team sport. Yeah, it's not a team sport generally In the same way, yeah. Right. You do just kind of get isolated and you have to spend all this time on the ice and so much work and there's so much gym work and preparation and stuff outside of it that it's great to see that there can be so much fun and so much friendship and these incredible adventures that come from it as well. I might be belaboring the point a little bit, but I think that those things are really important. I also want to point out in terms of that broader audience appeal, Ilya Malinin, while I know we've already discussed in our previous episodes, his world's performance, I think it's worth noting that you're seeing a broader awareness of him in the past couple of weeks. I've seen him talked about by people that do not know anything about figure skating. I loved listening to the run through wrap up of world's from Adam Rapon and Ashley Wagner and Sarah Hughes, because Adam mentioned that he was getting texts from people that he knows are not skating fans, but they wanted to know who this Ilya kid was because they watched his program and they were starting to feel feelings. And they're just like, this is giving me some emotions and I want to understand what what's happening here because this seems important. And I had a similar moment where I was sitting on my couch right after Ilya skated that program A friend of mine in Minneapolis texted me and I haven't gotten a text from her in a while. And it was just like, oh, my God, Ilya Malinin is incredible because she knows I'm a skating fan and she was watching it. That was just a really nice moment of my friend connecting with me that I haven't talked to in a while. But at the same time, I'm like, she's watching this. She's aware of who Ilya Malinin is. That's really cool. Yeah. And his free skate performance on YouTube. Last time I checked, it had like 3.2 million views. Yeah. We've talked before about what virality means for skating stuff right now, like what stuff will actually get shared. And sometimes it's very surprising, like La Priva and Basso that like kind of took off on TikTok with a gala performance from Euros. And that other things that we would think of should be the big viral moments haven't really taken it. We really haven't had a big moment since like Tessa and Scott at the Olympics. Yeah. So to have Ilya's skate, have millions and millions of views on it at this point like that feels like a big deal and hopefully will bring in a level of excitement and new people who will look at this and go okay there's really something to watch here i know it's a little bit of a deviation from the show so i'll I'll scoot us back towards that but i do think it's relevant in the trying to figure out how to get more people excited about skating again in the u.s yeah and you know if you listen to the show like that's one of our missions is like it really (laughs) is build more fan base (laughs) Beyond just what was going on at Stars on Ice Japan, currently you also have the French national team tour happening in Europe, which is really cool that their whole national team goes... Terrible outfits, but very cool otherwise. (laughs) I haven't seen these outfits you speak of. They're like orange and navy or something, and they're not my particular taste. Fair. A few of them pull it off pretty well, but still, yeah. (laughs) I think the thing that has brought me the most joy is I mean it's cool to see people like Adam Siohimfa getting big love on this tour but it's seeing Kevin Amos after the torturous season that he's had being out there showing off on social media his quads his triple axles and just his general incredibleness showing back up I love 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 that on this tour he's doing his bolero program yeah i feel like he's reclaiming it after the disasters he had with it over the end of this past season we knew that program was brilliant to begin with so to see him come back and instead of i mean he could have thrown that thing in the trash and nobody would ever blame him for it in his place i think i would have buried that and just said (laughs) that happened at skate america and i never did it again (laughs) Yeah, for him to reclaim it and take it out as an exhibition piece, I think is actually really wonderful. It really is. 
Also on the tour are Gabby and Guillaume, who were still kind of in the will they, won't they stage of are they going to come back to competition? And while all season I have been convinced that they will, it now kind of feels like maybe they won't, but it's still TBD. Yeah. So Gabby Papadakis and Guillaume Suzerone, Olympic champions, brilliant skaters. Icons ev- of yeah, the sport. Ev- yeah. Everybody's been asking for the last two years. They won the Olympics and they're like, cool, they took some time off and that's understandable, but they've never made an official statement about whether they'd be done or not. They've done lots of show skating. A ton of the fandom desperately wants them to return. I've said on the show before, I'm a little lukewarm on that. I don't necessarily need a return from them, but I understand why people would want it because they are such wonderful skaters. But everything that we're hearing out of the Montreal Academy and from the team working with them is that while they're doing the show skating, they are not really connecting personally on what they want to do next. Romain out of Montreal even kind of said they're not communicating well. They can't get on the same page. I really wouldn't count on anything from them, which is an interesting thing to come out of their coaching staff as a statement. It certainly isn't a definitive yes or no, but it certainly doesn't sound encouraging. And while they don't necessarily have to come back this coming season, it would be helpful if they did to kind of rebuild some momentum towards the Olympic year. But they may still sit out another year and then surprise us next year. They may make an announcement in a month. Who knows right now? But at least as of today, it does not sound promising. You see Guillaume share a lot of solo stuff, like yeah. a lot of solo skating stuff, which is incredible, as you would expect. Oh, of it's course. absolutely phenomenal. But Gabby gave an interview fairly recently for like a French magazine. It's worth a read for yeah, sure. It's definitely worth a read. And I think that it doesn't make it feel very promising because she seems very cynical about the business of skating in a lot of ways and her experience with it. And that's understandable from everything she describes in terms of her experience. Yeah, it does put a lot of it in question. I think a lot of the big fans I've seen online talking about it have taken a turn from like, they should be coming back to the, oh, guys, this isn't going to happen, is it? And I mean, that's all speculation. I mean, they could change their mind leading into this next season or the one beyond it. It's hard telling. But yeah, right now, I wouldn't feel very bullish on that idea, but... Not so much. Yeah, who knows? So while there is a lack of tours in the U.S. this season, there is a bit of a surprise that popped up a few weeks ago. A one-night-only show in Leesburg, Virginia, which is near where Ilya Malinin is from, called Gold on Ice. And it's happening April 19th. And obviously, it's starring Ilya Malinin. <laughs> is it actually called Ilya Malinin and Gold on Ice? No, I I don't think so. Or is that so. just the way some it, maybe no, it's social just, accounts promoting no, or something? No, it, it's called Gold on Ice. But if you go to the Instagram handle, it says Ilya Malinin and the greatest show on ice. Oh, okay. <laughs> gotcha. And it's all caps, only U.S. show. So it's only a one night in Leesburg, Virginia, which is a bummer because they've really created a great lineup for this. You've got, of course, obviously, Ilya, your reigning world champion. You have Madison Chalk and Evan Bates, your reigning world ice dance champions. You have Deanna and Max, your reigning Paris champions from <laughs> Canada. You have Isabeau Levito, your reigning silver medalist from women. You have Donovan Creo from Mexico, who, of course, is, while not a high-ranked skater right now, is an absolute crowd favorite and an totally. amazing performer. I'm so excited that Donovan gets to be part of this. I, I think that's amazing. You get Polina Edmonds, who is a retired competitive skater, but, of course, very well-known off the circuit and a very successful women's skater and who has um, been back and doing performances. Emily Brody and Ian Somerville, who are upcoming U.S. ice dancers. Sarah Everhart, an upcoming women's skater. Who trains with Ilya. Right. And who is notable for having some really great jump technique. And she was impressive at U.S. Nationals. Very much so. Definitely put her as one to watch. And then you've got crowd favorite and absolute Canadian wonderkind kick and messing yeah, as well. And it's all hosted by Gracie Gold. Yeah. Which I'm sure the pun is very intended with of Gold course, on Ice. Uh, yeah. but, you can never get away from that. No, yeah. of course not. But Super fun, and I am super jealous of anyone that gets to go to this. I wish that there had been a little bit more of a heads up that this was happening. Right, yeah. We heard about it a few days ago, and I'm like, we could have 
dropped some things and made a flight to Virginia. For we could have road like tripped. That. That's not, right, I it's mean, not that far. It's yeah. not that bad of a trip. So, yeah, we could have made that happen. And I'm sure a lot of other people are feeling that way. But good for anyone that's nearby or could quickly drop everything and make a trek out there because I'm sure it's going to be a really good time. This is a baller event. I mean, it like is. that's so many great people. And I love that you do have people like Donovan and Polina and Roddy and Somerville and up and comers on it. Because if there's an argument that I have with Stars on Ice, at least the American edition, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, but it's just that they are so insistent on everybody having to be like a champion. Yes. And there are so many fantastic skaters who are crowd favorites that don't have big league medals to their names, but will absolutely be a draw. So to see some of those names here where I'm like, Donovan has a fan base. The guy has not placed in the top 10 at anything real notable, but it doesn't matter because he's such an exciting, engaging skater. And the fact that he is the great skating hope of Mexico. I uh, love it so much. <laughs> fabulous. I wish we could see more shows like this in non-gigantic venues. I mean, let's just dig into why Stars on Ice isn't going on tour this year. And I mean, really, it's at least what we understand is that there was a lack of ability to book enough notable skaters and book enough venues that they could fill and sell enough tickets for to make it worthwhile. With that in mind, you look at the history of what Stars on Ice had been. It's been around a really long time and it used to always have this rotating cast, but kind of a core group year over year that would stick around that were very big stars. But then you'd also have people that just came in and were more not necessarily household names, but were fun and great show skaters. Like a Michael Weiss. Mean, yeah, like, that. like Michael Weiss or Ryan Bradley, I think, is, is a good person, like people that aren't super well known. And then they'd mix them in with your Tara Lipinski's or your Johnny Weir's. I don't even know if Johnny Weir actually ever. In fact, I don't think he did ever do Stars on Ice, but I could be wrong. Weird. But, you know, your Ashley Wagner's people that were bigger names mixed with people that weren't. Now I feel like there is this rule and I don't know it when it started. So if anybody does, please tell me. But there was a shift at some point where it had to be like if you didn't have a certain big title, they'd bring you in for like a few shows as like a guest star. But as a tour regular, you had to be at a certain level of notoriety. And I totally get that when you're trying to sell tickets. It's a it, marketability thing. I get that. A hundred percent. But I do think that there is an argument to be made for looking at someone like an Amber Glenn, who just won her first U.S. title and has never been invited to go on Stars on Ice. And the year that she wins her U.S. title, this tour isn't happening in the U.S. And she which, tweeted about that because she was really disappointed. In well, right. But the fact that Amber Glenn was never invited before seems baffling, not only from the standpoint of she's a fantastic skater, but also look at her social presence. If you want to bring young people out to arenas, why are you only looking at if you won the U.S. national title and not at who has a built-in fan base that is going to want to come out and see her. It's really kind of shocking that that isn't a consideration. And why have they never taken Star Andrews out on a tour? Exactly. Right? Competitive at top podiums all the time? Not necessarily, although, you know, she's had a really nice placement on the Grand Prix before. But she is a phenomenal skater that fans love. And because she doesn't carry one of those titles, doesn't get invited on those things. But she would be a draw. Stars on Ice Canada is really smart when they have brought out Alaj Balde because he is a social media star. I'm not just trying to say it's only about social media, but it doesn't hurt that he carries something like close to a million followers on Instagram. That's not nothing. And that also sells tickets. Medals don't just sell tickets. There are other ways to measure how popular someone may be. And there are so many dynamite skaters in a very competitive landscape that people would love to see and that just feel like a massive missed opportunity. 
you know, it's great that we got to see Satoko on that tour. And I mean, I made the joke online that you could just rename Stars on Ice to Satoko and Friends and I'd go. That would be perfectly fine <laughs> because, you know, she's incredible and obviously everybody loves her. So there's yeah. a reason why she gets brought out all the time. But you have so many terrific skaters in Japan, in Korea, in China that I feel like never get brought to American tours. Yeah. And that would be wonderful to see over here. They get brought to one off events sometimes. Yes, but I agree with you. That's the other part of stop just looking at people that are from the United States. Thanks to the Internet, the world's a lot smaller. And I feel like there's a lot more fans of people that are from everywhere. I get it during the pandemic why everything kind of narrowed down into like just people that are nearby. So there's not a lot of international travel. But if you want to bring people in, how do we get a tour with Kauri Sakamoto? Because I will fly somewhere <laughs> with it to go see Kauri. I would kill to see Shoma Uno. And, you know, not everyone can afford to travel to Japan to see them. So it does make me sad that I haven't gotten that opportunity. It is nice to see some other small club shows pop up, like the Ice Chip show that just happened at the Skating Club of Boston. Yeah. I mean, that had Jason Brown and Amber Glenn. I mean, those are two extremely notable American skaters with a big fan base. And it sounded like that event was really cool. Not a particularly large venue, not a... But it's the Skating Club of Boston. Yeah, That's still pretty great. Yeah, it's good size. But I think that America... And American promoters have this feeling like everything needs to be full stadium things. Yes. And, you know, we were talking about not getting a Stars on Ice this year. When we saw it, we saw it at Rosemont just outside of Chicago. And we had a really good sized audience. But it was still probably only like 5,000. Yeah, maybe 5,000. It's not a huge venue, but it's a nice sized venue. And the audience filled up, I would think, about three quarters of the place based on our perspective of it. And it was great. It was an enthusiastic crowd. Everybody really enjoyed themselves. People just hung out in the hallways afterwards just yeah. because it was such a good vibe. Everybody just wanted to continue it on after it was over, which was awesome to see. There was something that made me think about how as a person who's a musician and, and we used to go to tons and tons of shows all the time because I worked in music radio. Big, big shows are cool. You know, big stadium shows, amphitheater shows are impressive or concerts. But there's something special about the small club shows that are a little bit more intimate where you can absolutely fill a place and where the energy of 3000 people can feel just as big as the energy of 10,000 people in the right kind of environment. I would love to see more skating shows like that. My hope is that this Gold on Ice in Virginia event is such a banger of an event and hopefully sells really well and gets a lot of attention. And that it makes it possible that maybe they could say, well, maybe it's not a tour, but we do two more events, you know, maybe yeah. do one in the Midwest and one on the West Coast or something, because that lineup is fabulous. And it doesn't have to be the same group of people every time. I see people talk about online a lot. They're like, I'd love to go see some skating, but it never comes within 500 miles of me. We had to drive five hours to see it. Yeah. We're Americans. Driving five hours is no big deal. That's Yeah, a, unfortunately, but it's true. <laughs> right. <laughs> it doesn't feel that weird to us to go that kind of distance, but not everybody has that ability. You no. know, three hours to see something and three hours home, like it's a day trip. I'll do that anytime, right? Like that's For no sure. big deal. But it would be nice to see more of an accessible tour where they can go to smaller venues. Yes. And more people can see them. And it doesn't have to be all of the pageantry of crazy lights and special effects and screens on the floor, whatever that you see with some of the Stars Nice events. In the end, I just want to see great skaters skate. Yeah. I don't really care how fancy it is. I've talked a lot in the past. One of my favorite things to watch online is Yellen Kim's performance from An Evening with Champions, the Paul Wiley hosted event. And that's not a big event. That's no. not super. I think it does happen at Boston, though, doesn't it? It happens in Boston, but um, I think it's like Harvard University. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So it's not a huge thing. The production value is not over the top, but the performances there are beautiful. And I go back to that one all the time because Yellen's performance in that one is just lyrical and perfect. Yeah, you don't need much more than a dark place with some ice and a spotlight. And I think you're good. Yeah, I'm definitely hoping to see a few more one-off events pop up throughout the summer, you know, whether it's at smaller skating clubs or, you know, smaller venues, it would be really nice to see, but we'll have to wait and see. 
some people that I saw, like, and, and this was to what I was getting to a minute ago with Stars on Ice, that we saw it with a great crowd, but there were some people that I've seen say that their Stars on Ice shows were really undersold. Yeah. So that event in, in several places were in fairly big venues without big audiences, which is a one is a real shame that speaks to the sport being less popular than it should be in the States, but also probably a lot to how it's marketed and, and how it's put out there. And how expensive it is. Right. Because even with Stars and Ice last year when we went to see it, we knew about it because we went to the Stars and Ice website and looked up the information. I don't know that I ever saw it promoted anywhere other than maybe like an Instagram post from somebody. So, you know, I think that there's some work to be done as far as getting that out in front of people as well. Yeah, it's the overall issue we're seeing with awareness and popularity of the sport. I'm hoping that next season leading towards an Olympic Games, we're going to have a tour again, but we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. In the meantime, if you guys know of other, you know, shows that we should be looking at or paying attention to, please let us know. One thing I know is that the Sun Valley always does its summer shows. So if anyone has the uh, ability to fly to Idaho (laughs) from July through August, I mean, apparently it's this beautiful resort in Sun Valley, Idaho. In Idaho? Yeah. It's not that far from us. Uh, (laughs) Oh, it's pretty far. (laughs) Okay. Um, It does look gorgeous and picturesque. Last season, I know they, um, they bring in headliners to kind of be a part of their shows week over week. So uh, last season, they had Nathan Chen, they had Jason Brown, they had Mariah Bell, Kate Hawaiik, and Jean-Luc Baker. So I'm excited to see who they bring in. I would love to go. I don't think that's feasible for us this summer. Probably not this summer. Probably not. But if you get to go, have a great time. (laughs) Yeah. So this is obviously a very much an an off-season episode. Oh, very much so. (laughs) Uh, And thinking about how the rest of this summer is going to go, we're going to be experimenting with the content of this podcast and the video stuff that we do on YouTube through the off season, really until kind of the challenger series um, begins and, you know, a lot of the major competitions. I mean, this is for all skating fans. It's the long dark. It's, you know, the wait until you're like, give me more competitive skating. Yes. Beginning of August. Cranberry right. cup. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. We, so we have a little time leading up to that. Thinking about that going forward, we don't have a defined schedule for what we're going to be doing next. We do plan on doing interviews. Yes. Uh, we do plan on doing deep dives into things like the nature of ice dance and its rules and some of the changes that are kind of coming up with its programs and all that kind of stuff and lots of other deep dives along those lines. And then a lot of stuff that we want to do in video format, some of which may touch on things we've talked about on the show and other things that will be, I think, wildly different. So it's going to be a lot of experimentation. So I ask that you guys stick with us as we try some new things. Let us know what works. Let us know what doesn't. Let us know what you'd like to see. Yes. I mean, we are very open to your ideas and you've given us a bunch. I appreciate that, that we have heard from people both on YouTube, through the website, DMs on Instagram, giving us some really good content ideas for the off season. And we're going to be exploring a lot of that. I was hoping to be a little ahead on some of those things. COVID made that kind of difficult for me in this past week and change. So, you know, there's a little catch up to be done on that. But I think we're going to put some fun stuff together you guys are going to like. And hopefully it will uh, satiate all of us until we get back into a new competitive season. (laughs) Until we can get our fix. (laughs) With all that in mind, all of the usual stuff, the website for all things choreography is choreography.show. There you can find all of the links to listen to us on various platforms from YouTube to uh, Spotify to Apple Music. Google Podcast is gone. So ciao. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Bye-bye. But there are plenty of places to listen to podcasts. YouTube is kind of the primary one, and that's where the community has most of the conversations. And we always appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for all of that. So for Scoreography, I'm Adrian Buskey. And I'm Wendy Buskey. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye.